trying hard. Um, but it's not necessarily specific feedback about what the kids can and can't do. It's it's not um, necessarily specific feedback about what are the next steps in their learning. You know, what are the skills that they've demonstrated and what are the skills that um, they're having a bit of go at, but they haven't really mastered yet. And I think that's what we're really focused on, you know, going, going forward is, is really improving that experience for our students and parents so that you get very specific feedback um, on the skills and, and the knowledge in each of the subjects that your kids do. So um, just to recap, I, I, what I'm saying is uh, well, we're well aware at the moment that our assessment practices um, are a bit of a work in progress. And in particular, the feedback that we're giving parents is not our preferred reality. And it's been especially difficult, obviously, uh, through this remote learning phase. Uh, we're, we're committed to making sure that uh, we improve that. Um, and that's what we're going to talk um, to you about tonight. So Carrie Wallace, Assistant Principal for Learning and Teaching is with us here um, this evening. And I can see Shane Kruger, um, one of our other Assistant Principals is here. Um, we'll try our best to answer your questions as we go um, and uh, address any questions that you might have directly in the chat. So um, what I might do, uh, Carrie, is get you to start up um, the presentation and uh, and we're going to, to tag team it a bit this evening. So um, a few weeks ago, I talked to Carrie about, I, I think we need to try and take the opportunity to talk to our parents directly about their experiences and um, give them a bit of an insight into what our plans are um, and give you an opportunity to, to ask questions. And that's the um, intention and, and the purpose that sits behind tonight's session. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, what we've really been focused on over the last 18 months is, is developmental assessment. And we'll talk to you tonight about what developmental assessment is. Uh, we're going to talk to you um, specifically about um, why we think it's important to really focus on learning growth and not grades. Um, we're going to focus on the limitations currently that, that uh, exist within learning tasks in Compass. And Carrie's done uh, quite a bit of work around that area recently. And then we're going to talk about what the future holds, um, and in particular, a new product called Maestro. Um, and I think Maestro will really revolutionise our focus with developmental assessment at our school. Um, and uh, not only that, I think uh, what we're doing with Maestro will be replicated with schools um, right around the state and right around the country. So what I might do is have a break from uh, talking, uh, Miss Wallace. Uh, Carrie, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Kevin. So a couple of, uh, probably two years ago, I remember a year seven English teacher came to me and he had a piece of um, writing and it was called Goodbye Pra, as you can see on the slide there. And um, he was really concerned, obviously, with this particular student's um, writing and he really wanted to help her at her point of need. The, the current grading scale that we have in place meant that he would had to give her a very low for her piece of writing and then he worked really hard with her over the next couple of terms. Um, and in term three, um, when we were doing trash, she was able to produce a much more succinct piece of writing, as you can see on the right there. So her skills had really, really improved, um, which, which was fantastic. But our assessment practices meant that she was still getting a low. So for this particular student, after working so hard for two terms, to still get go from a very low to a low, was really difficult for her and it meant too that we weren't providing that quality feedback to her about where she needed to make those improvements um, and the focus being on the grade rather than the actual quality feedback and the skills that she needed to really address wasn't being met. Um, as uh, Last year um, when we started working towards developmental assessment, our staff did a whole lot of work in, in coming up with the learning continuum where we mapped the key skills and knowledge from level five right up to level 10 on the Victorian curriculum. So we got into, into small groups over term three of last year when we were in remote learning and, and staff worked really hard to pull apart the Victorian curriculum and identify what those key skills that we wanted to teach our students across every discipline at every year level, um, going from level five to level, level 10 um, B. So here is just a snapshot. It's a small um, uh, example of the, of the learning continuum for writing. Um, and as you can see down the bottom, we've identified what those key skills are, and then we've started to map them at each level on the Victorian curriculum. 
From there, we pull down from the learning continuum into a developmental rubric where we start to add granular steps in between each of those levels on the Victorian curriculum. And we start to really identify and articulate what those added granular steps are. So how a student can get from one level to the next level. And you can see there we've got the added granular steps in between level five and level six. So I just wanted to talk to you just about the grades and the grading scale. So before, when I first started, I was talking about those two pieces of writing. So as you can see on the left, we've got the personal narrative, the text one, and that's um, that an extract from that piece of writing. So again, as I said before, that piece of writing would have been allocated a very low. And then in term three, the improved piece of writing would have been allocated a low, perhaps a medium low. However, that quality feedback is what's really missing. If we used, if we were to use our developmental rubrics with this um, student uh, two years ago, we would have been able to identify that the first piece of writing probably would have been right down there on I need support, so below that level five. As you can see though in the second text in term three, we would have been able to really identify what some of those key skills are. And if we look at the cohesion with the paragraphs in particular, you can start to see that this student's starting to use synonyms, which is a working towards level seven skill. And you can see the growth that this student would be able to demonstrate in this particular skill. And that feedback would be really targeted that we would be able to, to give this particular student. So instead of giving a, a low and a very low, um, we're actually providing much more targeted feedback to help that student be able to start to improve writing. And that's just in one of those key skills. There would be numerous key skills that would be able to provide that targeted feedback around. Um, as Kevin said, um, I know that this transition from going from that, the grading scale and the CAIs and we're moving away from that, that assessment practice and we're embracing the developmental assessment and the developmental rubrics. And I understand that in that transition, we it's things are a little bit messy in the way that we're providing that, that feedback to um, parents. Two weekends ago, I'm off the back of quite a few parents feeding back to me that they were really concerned that they weren't getting that feedback, that quality feedback that they needed. Um, I think I spent about 16 hours going through every learning task that had been posted in semester one for every staff member um, throughout that semester. And I identified that, that out of the 1,930 learning tasks that were posted in semester one, there was 66% of those learning tasks that had some sort of grade or level attached. And of those 1,930 learning tasks, there were 45% of those had some sort of comment that provided feedback about where a student was and what those next steps in the learning are. And that's what we're attributing to what quality feedback is. So a grade on its own, isn't going to give you the quality feedback in being able to articulate what those next steps in learning are. But the quality feedback in, in terms of a comment or with our developmental assessment, that developmental rubric that, that articulates what those targeted levels of improvement are, is what we're really trying to focus on. So of that, there was only 45%. So the concerns that parents have been feeding back to us are validated. They're there. We, we, we understand it. And we've shared this data with our um, staff as well. So our goal is to be improve that quality feedback. We want to get to a point where we're giving more quality feedback than just a greater level on its own, because we know that that's not going to help a student improve in their learning and go to that next level. Um, we have been working with our staff over the last couple of weeks and learning area leaders been talking with teams of staff around some of this data and in, in, in specifically in different learning areas. and. We will be meeting next week to come up with some guidelines about what, how we want to communicate this quality feedback to parents and make sure that we're not overwhelming you with a huge amount of learning tasks that you don't need to see that might be practice tasks or it might be homework, et cetera, but be able to give you confidence that we're giving you learning tasks that will provide you of an idea of where your student is and what those next steps are. So that's in the interim on our way to moving towards Maestro. Once we have transitioned all of our 
cohorts to Maestro, we're pretty confident that Maestro will be able to replace the learning class system that we're using in Compass. Did you want to talk again, Miss uh, Kevin? Or do, would you like me to go straight into Maestro? Ah, thank you. Um, you had me muted and I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> So I don't know if that's deliberate. Uh, maybe you should try that in some of our principal meetings. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, look, I, I just wanted to say uh, it was interesting. Uh, I talked about my own kids before and um, I was on their compass page uh, earlier today, just checking, double checking the time that their uh, their interviews were on this evening. And, and one of the first things I noticed um, was the amount of overdue learning tasks that they had. Um, and And I know for many of you, um, you have equally that same frustration. And I can see some parents who are here tonight, you know, I've personally had those conversations um, with you. So, you know, I know that that's a, that's a real frustration. Um, and it's it's not just about, you know, what, what learning tasks or what assessments are, have got done, but it's often as Carrie said, the level of feedback that you, you get from that. So I think there are real limitations built into the current system that we've got and we've identified that. Um, and this year, particularly with year seven students, lesser, to a lesser extent, um, year 11 and not so much with the other year levels. Um, you know, that's why we've, we've significantly changed our approach um, to make sure, as, as Carrie pointed out, that we're really identifying what our students can and can't do, um, where that sits on a learning continuum and how much growth they're able to demonstrate. Um, and I think that that's, that's really what, um, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on in particular. Um, I think it's been unfair in the past to, to overly focus on grades and, um, you know, how students might be able to achieve or the level they might be able to achieve in relation to their, their grades. And, and a much uh, more important focus really should be around um, their, their growth and what they've um, been able to, to demonstrate over a period of time as my dog tries to um, steal my remaining dinner. Um, so, you know, that's that's what we really focused on. I remember two years ago at our awards um, evening, um, trying to, to have a conversation with parents when we were recognising academic achievement and pointing out that in future, um, we wanted to, to, to focus a little bit more heavily on growth. And those students that have demonstrated outstanding growth, it's still important to um, recognise achievement it's still important to recognise those those students that do outstandingly well with their their subjects. But more importantly, um, we should be recognising those who have uh, achieved outstanding growth. For example, you know, a year seven who might get straight A's and, and and might always find you know school pretty easy and you know doesn't have that many difficulties or struggles uh, with their learning. You know, will often get outstanding results and, and might get an academic achievement. And we all celebrate that and their parents celebrate that and they celebrate that and, and they rightfully should. But equally, if after a year, a year seven student um, who had entered year seven at grade five level is able to achieve a year seven level um, by the end of their first year. So two years growth in one year. You know, I think that's even more special and I think that deserves even more recognition. Um, and, and I think that's what we need to celebrate. But to do that, we need to identify where students are at first. Uh, and traditionally, that's been you know really difficult because we don't necessarily have the tools to be able to do that accurately. Um, but with developmental assessment and developmental rubrics, we can better do that. And that's what we've really been focused on. Um, and, and our work with, with Maestro has been really important to that. Um, so, you know, what we're going to take you a bit of time talking to you about today is, um, is the uh, Maestro product, and that will give you a better idea of, of how we're going to do that and what that means in um, practice. Um, but I, equally, I think it's important that we we talk to you about um, grades and, and why we're moving away from focusing on grades, why we want staff to move away from assessing um, students' work with grades. I mean, Carrie talked about the fact that, that many of our staff uh, we'll give grades, but not enough feedback. Um, and why we want to focus on giving quality feedback um, with assessments um, and not necessarily grades. And I might just pause there and, and let you take over, um, Carrie, as I get rid of the dog. <laughs> yeah, Nicoletta, you put a, a good question in the chat feed, and that's a question that a lot of our um, staff are grappling with as well. And a lot of our um, 
our parents and students will grapple with as well. So the research shows us, evidence shows us that when students are looking at grades and feedback, they focus more on the grades than the feedback. And that's um, th that's that's been evidenced in lots of different case studies that we've looked at, but that the students don't look beyond the grade for the feedback as well. Um, what we're focusing on, and as Kevin said before, we're still saying that achievement has a place, but we need to look at what the purpose of the SAP is for. So if the purpose of the SAP is for learning and for being able to um, get quality feedback so they can go to that next level, the grades will actually get in the way of, of students being able to really understand and interrogate and look at the feedback and pull it apart. I would also say that using the developmental rubric still shows a student where they are and shows them how high up um, they, they're going in terms of, of reaching those goals. So in a developmental rubric for year 11, for example, they will have stretch skills that will start to be get, become really nuanced in terms of what that skill is and being able to demonstrate it. A particular example um, of one of our students in PE last year used a developmental rubric in his year 12 um, PE um, school and he ended up getting a 50, a perfect score, which is really hard to come by. And using that developmental rubric really helped him to break down what those skills were and to be able to demonstrate them. So, you know, I ardently believe that the developmental rubrics will work for all students. Um, so our struggling students to really support them in their in their growth as they start to, to develop those skills, but also for to really start to stretch um, our higher um, higher able uh, students as well. So I might just show you Maestro now. So this is my daughter, Ella, so you don't have to think that she's some random um, other other students. So this is Ella's um, year seven English class. So this is what Maestro will look like. So as you can see here, we've got Ella's beautiful face there on the side and we've got this unit of learning. So she's got her teacher code up the top and at the, here we've got poetry. So that's the unit of learning that she's working from. This developmental rubric has been pulled down from the learning continuum. So as I was showing you before with our writing, our reading and viewing and our oral um, writing continuum, that's that's been pulled down into this unit um, of learning here. So as you can see, down here, this is how the marking would work. So you can see that the, the skills down here of what she needs to demonstrate in this unit of learning. And the students will already be familiar with these developmental rubrics. However, they won't be familiar with them being put into Maestro in this way. So the teachers will be able to, when Ella demonstrates that she can describe the phases or stages of the text, um, they will be able to mark her here. In working towards level six, they might say actually she can sort of explain the link between the different phases of a poem she's getting there. So she might be able to be put at consolidating, which indicates that she's, she's getting there. She may have demonstrated it once and needs to demonstrate it again in a couple of weeks to show it's gone into that long-term memory. And then um, towards the end of the unit of learning, they might say, actually, yeah, she's got to level six and she's been able to demonstrate that particular skill. So that's how the teachers will be using it from a marking point of view. And then that will be date stamped as to when these students have been able to, when she's been able to demonstrate each of those key skills. Um, as she goes, we'll be able to start to record um, um, uh, the longitudinal data of, of Alice. So as she starts to demonstrate different key skills at different levels, we'll start to see where she's being able to, to develop and the pace and the growth of her, uh, of her development and her learning progression. We'll also be able to um, we'll also be able to um, So this is the developmental rubric here for a student view. So when students will be able to start seeing these, we'll also be able to add 
worked examples into each part of the, the developmental rubric and the different stages. So for example, at working towards level six, so this is the, the poetry unit of learning, I can identify words that rhyme. We will have already been able to upload it with different examples of what that will look like. So the students will start to be able to access those worked examples in their developmental rubric as well. Kevin, did you want to talk any more about the Maestro? Thank you. <laughs> I would love to talk about it. I just needed you to unmute me. Um, yeah, look, I think you, you've, um, you know, you've, you've demonstrated the features uh, pretty well, um, Carrie. Look, uh, what Maestro is going to allow us to do, which we haven't really been able to do previously, is it's going to allow us to um, assess in, in a much um, clearer and more easier way than, than we currently have. A lot of these developmental rubrics that you're you're seeing, you may have seen um, if you're a parent of a year seven um, and they'd be in the form of an Excel spreadsheet or on a, on a document and you might have seen um, some of those that you'd be um, sharing um, with with your, your kids and, and the teachers. Um, Maestro is going to allow us to do that in a way that um, will allow you to see that information in real time and it will allow the students to be able to see that in real time as well. So once we set up a, a unit of learning and we include developmental rubrics, um, you'll have access to them um, and you'll be able to see them. You'll be able to see which skills and, and knowledge are focused on that unit of learning. And we'll also be, you'll be able to also see um, how uh, <laughs> are assessing um, that as well. You know, that I think is um, something that um, you know parents haven't necessarily had access to be to before. You, you've certainly seen uh, rubrics before. You've had access to those in Compass, um, but you haven't seen uh, rubrics that have been developmental in nature and that have been aligned to the key skills and knowledge in a particular subject. So, if for example, um, you want to know uh, what um, your son or daughter might be studying in English, um, what the unit of learning might be, and it might be poetry, for example, um, then you'll have a good understanding of the particular key skills in that poetry unit and what uh, your um, child can do and what the next steps in their learning um, will be. And not only that, once we then go on to a, a different unit of learning, which includes those key skills, it will drag across that previous information. So all that information is say once a, a, a teacher has marked that um, a student has been able to do that skill, that will automatically be pre-filled in the next rubric. So a, a teacher doesn't have to start again and think about where a student might be on the developmental continuum. So from one year to the next, if a teacher is picking up a year eight uh, English class in Maestro, the uh, levels that the students have established and demonstrated in year seven will be there ready to go and able to be accessed by the teachers. This will make the planning a lot easier for the teachers. They'll know where to target their teaching from the very start. They won't have to spend time at the start of the unit um, doing some formative assessment or some pre-assessment before the unit starts. That information will be um, specifically available to uh, the teachers um, before we start. So that's, I think, a real key feature. It will it will make a big difference, we think, um, to the assessment and the planning for, for teachers as well. But Bree, um, you'll be able to see all of that information um, in Maestro. And Maestro has only just been released. This is a product um, that's been developed um, by a company called Analytics for Schools that we've been working with. Um, Dr. Jesus Camacho uh, Molas is from the University of, of Melbourne School of Education. He's developed this product specifically for us. This is the first of its time anywhere in the world, um, and uh, and we've pioneered it. And um, you know we think it'll be a, a, a really important tool for us to be able to embed developmental assessment practices and get the most um, out of it. And as yes, Barisa, you'll be able to see that information. The kids will be able to see that information. Not only can you see what's in the developmental rubric, you can see um, where uh, your son or daughter has been assessed, you know, that day or yesterday, you'll be able to look at their growth in particular subjects and in particular skills, you know, over a period of time, you'll have that information there um, ready to go. So, you know, that's really uh, important. Um, I might um, 
ask you some of these uh, questions that are in the chat, Carrie, and, and get you to respond. So um, I think I've answered Bree's one. I know there's the the, the one from Michelle and, and Nicoletta up above in relation to grades. I'll come back to that one. Um, but uh, Nicoletta says, doesn't having all the developmental rubric boxes in my Maestro ticked equate to achieving the highest exam score? So Nicoletta will still be giving exam scores. So the idea is that in the SACs, the SACs are the, the progression of learning to prepare for the exams at the end of um, at end of the year or in year 11 for the end of the semester. So there's still a place for those exam scores. But in the developmental rubric, they're the key skills that are broken down that the student needs to be able to demonstrate. So if we can start to look and, and address each of those key skills, that student's going to be really, really well prepared to be able to then demonstrate their, their knowledge and their skill in the exam and to be able to satisfy um, the, the task there. So it, it, it's not saying that that it's only the developmental rubric and there's not a place for exam. It's being able to use what the, um, the, the look at the purpose of what the assessment is for. Yeah, I think I think it's it's really important. Um, and and part of the reason that we had, you know, I guess the discussion around the purpose of this meeting is I know um, that for many of you parents, like many of our teachers, um, there will be real concerns about um, an absence of a grade or a score um, with an assessment, and that's that's understandable. But what do we know about that? Um, if you get a chance, I'd love you to have a look at the YouTube video. Um, Dylan William, a, a world-renowned assessment expert, um, have a look at that. And, and what you'll see is a couple of things. Firstly, um, we know that uh, if you don't give grades, those students at the top, um, that affects them. Uh, they get quite disappointed. Um, they get quite upset and they don't like the fact that they're not getting you know, that positive reinforcement in the way of, of a grade um, or a mark. But equally, we know that when we give grades and marks, it disempowers and frustrates those kids who aren't as capable. Uh, moreover, we know that if we give grades and comments, that doesn't have as much of a positive impact on learning than just giving comments. We know, as Carrie said earlier, that when you give a grade, the students will focus on the grade and often will forget the feedback. So if I said to your kid, you got 76% on their exam, for many, that's all they will hear. That's all they're interested in. And the rest of the feedback will be forgotten. And we miss that whole opportunity to use that feedback to improve performance next time. And remember, there is a difference between assessment for performance and assessment for learning. And we will still have opportunities to assess performance. So when our students do exams, they'll be assessed for their performance and they'll get a grade or they'll get a score. But when they do other tasks, it's important that we use assessment for learning. And that's the purpose of assessment. That the purpose of assessment is not to make people feel good. You know, I got a 90% or I got a 95%. I know myself as a parent, you know, there's a bit of an ego boost for my kids when they get an A or they get a great score. And I got some, you know, really positive feedback from the teachers today, um, from my kids. You know, they're going great. They're doing well. They're a delight to have in class. Excellent work, you know, um, you know, really good quality work, working hard. None of that has an impact on his learning or her learning. None of that puts me in a position to be able to help them with their learning. If those teachers had have told me specifically what it was in the in relation to the skills um, or the key pieces of knowledge that my kids could or couldn't do, then I would understand you know what the next steps in their learning are and how I could assist with that. But if we just want to focus on grades um, and we just want to focus on marks, we're not going to be able to have as big an, an influence on the learning process. And, and that's not just my gut feeling and anecdotal evidence, that's what the evidence and the research says. And, and you know, we're not making this decision lightly. It's not just, you know, we had a bit of a, a light bulb moment and we thought about, well, let's try something different. Let's not give grades and let's give feedback via rubrics. We know through months and months of research, engaging with experts um, in lots of professional learning, um, if we look at the evidence and research, this is the approach that works. 
you know, we're not throwing grades out. Um, there'll be, there's a time and place for grades, um, but assessment is used best when it's used for feedback purposes. And it's and I think feedback, oh. feedback's not as effective when students just get caught up on the grade, or sometimes we as parents get caught up in the grade. Um, and and so what we need to focus on is giving kids an opportunity to explore the feedback, to better understand what they can can and can't do. Um, and I, I think I'll, I'll go back. Uh, sorry, let me just go back to a point. I think. Um, you made um, Nicola about Ulysses. Ulysses was told he wasn't going to get his percentage score, but his concern is that's what they go um, by to achieve uni scores. But um, I think there's a there's a real misnomer about that. If if a year twelve gives a, a percentage grade, let's say a seventy five percentage grade, seventy five percent, what does that mean? Seventy five percent for what? And in relation to who? Because we know that Ulysses is not just competing against his class, he's competing against every student in Victoria. So what a 75% might mean for a student at One Turner College is different to what a 75% um, might mean for someone who goes to um, Orbost or Shepparton or someone who goes to Scotch or Xavier. The actual score doesn't mean much and doesn't tell the student much. What they need to understand is what they did well or what they didn't do so well and what their next steps are in their learning. And that's where developmental assessment is most effective because it gets students to start exploring what it was that they didn't do as effectively, what it is they need to do better at, and it breaks it down into the skill and area of key, uh, key knowledge. So I would disagree with you, um, uh, Prue, in relation to that. Um, it's the, the best quality feedback you will get is in a rubric. Um, it's it's not, and, and in a rubric, you'll often get some comments from teachers, and we're not just saying too that you know teachers will give rubrics and that will be the end of the conversation. You know, we would expect teachers will still have a comment, have have a conversation with students. They'll often give work back, you know, with annotations and and that sort of feedback, and that's important as well. Um, but you know, we think the starting point is is with the rubric. So um, I take your point. It's not just about the rubrics alone. We have no intention of just saying there's the rubric. You know, go and digest that, and off you go. Um, there's lots of other bits of feedback that we need to give as well, and that will happen. Um, but we know that the rubric is the most that is the highest quality form of feedback that we can give, and that information we think is vital to students in terms of understanding their learning. Carrie, I'll give. I'll have a break. Yeah, I, and Dylan William would argue too that the that quality feedback for a student should make a student work. That's the quality feedback. So, um, just taking someone's point earlier, that if you've set a test, say, and there's ten questions, rather than saying which question the student got wrong, you should say maybe you got three out of ten wrong. Find the three that you got wrong. So it starts to challenge the student to start looking through what they've done and being able to start to um, identify what areas that they need to work on as well and be able to work and think and respond to the feedback. And I think that's the issue that we've got at the moment is that we need to really understand what quality feedback is. And I totally um, understand and appreciate that parents want to know where their students are in their learning and what the next steps are. And again, as Kevin said, that's what a rubric does. It gives you an understanding about where your student is. So if I look back at that developmental rubric and I think of Ella and her poetry unit, I can understand where she is. If she's working towards level six, then I understand where she is and what she needs to do to help her get to that next step in her learning. And then I can see what those skills are and I can work with her at that, that level to be able to set those goals with her and it's no different at year 11 as well. You'll be able to see in the developmental rubric where the gaps are in the learning and what we really need to focus on because each of those key skills and knowledge that are needed to be demonstrated in the exam are broken down and put into a rubric and scaffolded to really be able to provide that learning progression that a student needs to work towards. Again, going back to that student that got the 50 in PE, that's exactly what he did. He used his developmental rubric, he evaluated his learning each time and he could set goals within that. If you get a 75%, um, that, that's not helping you set goals. You might want to you know, reach or aspire to a 78% or an 80%, but 
not being able to articulate what that 80 looks like and that that 80 will change depending on what school they're at the 80 the 80 is um, a fluid sort of mark as well so it's really important I think that we look past that grade so that we can really understand what the skill is or what the knowledge is that needs to be demonstrated. Yeah and I think um, to your point uh, I think it was Rachel I mean they'll they, as I said there, there'll still be a time for tests and a time for assessment of performance um, and you know parents will get that feedback and, and so will students but you know, we want, um, you know, a, a greater emphasis on formative assessment and developmental assessment. Um, we're not saying that's the only focus of assessment going forward and, and there will be developmental rubrics and nothing else. What we're saying is there's going to be a significant shift here. We've been focused for a very long time on summative assessment and, and that means we're always focused on assessing at the end of something. We're saying we're flipping that and we know the research means um, that will be more effective if we do that. So we're going to be assessing as we go, and we're going to be giving feedback to you and the students as you as they go. Um, if we teach a unit and then we assess at the end, it's it's not possible for a student to then um, always change based on that feedback uh, what they're doing to get better the next time. But if we can give that feedback in a developmental rubric as they're going then they're able to make changes in their learning and they're able to shift and they're able to grow. So we wanna focus on developmental assessment and formative assessment. We wanna focus on assessment as students are progressing and not have to wait to the end of the unit. And there'll be a time, as I said, um, you know, that we have to measure performance at the end of something, um, but that, and that will be part of our strategy as well. Um, so, you know, the, I think um, what, we're, we're trying to say is that um, we're, we're changing the emphasis here when we're not removing grades completely. Uh, we're not removing um, marks, so to speak, um, but their emphasis is, is going to be a lot less than what they have been in the past. And the approach is more going to be focused um, on the developmental assessment. Um, you know, when you talk about, you know, how's this going to work when, when a uh, we're going to have this rolled out. Well, at the moment, we've really focused heavily on, on year seven developmental assessment this year um, with year sevens, obviously, as I just said, and, and less so year 11s. It's it's uh, it's pretty straightforward in year seven to 10 because we have the Victorian curriculum and it's very easy to develop a learning continuum. It's it's a little bit trickier in year 11 and 12, and that will take us some time. And that journey has been a little bit more difficult and, and reflecting on some of the points that that have been raised there. And I think you you mentioned it, Mich Michelle, with your shaded rubric and no other feedback and comments. You know, that's that's not ideal necessarily if you're confused or you don't think you're getting the information or um, that, that that your kids are getting the information they need. Give us that feedback. Um, what we're saying is we're progressing, we're, we're transitioning to uh, this sort of assessment. Uh, we haven't got it right yet. It's not perfect, um, but that's what we're working towards. And the feedback that we get from you would be really helpful. Uh, there. So, you know, happy for you, Michelle, if you're able to share that with us so we can have a look at that uh, and we can refine our practice um, as we go. Um, so Ben and Jacinda just saying our daughter in year seven measures her own growth in rubric and lets the teacher know what she's able to do. Does the teacher double check this or are the kids evaluating themselves? That's a really good point. It's a bit of both. And what developmental assessment does um, is, is it allows students to have a learning continuum and, and therefore to understand where they think they are at in their learning. And Carrie talked about setting goals. So, you know, students can look at a, a developmental rubric, they can look at a learning continuum and they can self-assess. Now, I mean, clearly we don't, you know, just let the students self-assess and that determines where they're at in their learning. Um, you know, that, that happens with the teacher assessment. Um, but if students self-assess, um, then often, you know, that's a pretty accurate assessment of where they're at in their learning. Um, and it does help them um, better understand their next steps. And even the process of going through a developmental rubric and trying to work out where you're learning is a, is a powerful learning experience um, in itself. But to answer your question, I guess, Ben and Jacinda, um, the teacher does double check. Absolutely. It's the teacher at the end of the day who'll do the evaluation um, and focus on where they are in their learning. But the year sevens being able to have a look um, and, and measure their own growth or do their own self-assessment um, is really important, but the students should be able to, to measure their growth properly off the back of the evaluations that the teachers do. 
And I think the fantastic thing about that self-assessment and the peer assessment, so we've got lots of classes and lots of teachers encouraging their students to peer assess each other. And in fact, I had one teacher on Monday um, in a meeting talking to me about a peer assessment class that she had conducted and the students were starting to ask each other for evidence and their students had to then go back through their work and be able to find evidence of when they'd been able to demonstrate a particular key skill or knowledge. That learning right there is fantastic because they're starting to have ownership and agency about it and to really understand what that key skill and what that knowledge is. So that's, that's a really key um, pedagogical strategy that the teachers are using. But of course, as Kevin said, the teachers will come and, and they will then be, be looking for that evidence of learning as well. When students do have access and parents do have access, students will be able to start uploading evidence of their learning to particular um, granular steps or levels to be able to provide evidence of that particular skill or that particular um, knowledge. And then they will be able to go to the teacher and say, I think that I'm, I've been able to achieve that. What do you think? And be able to have those conversations. And that's a really powerful um, tool for students as well to have that agency in their learning and to become autonomous in that way. And that's what we're trying to work towards with students starting to self-assess, setting their learning goals and taking real ownership of their learning and their progression. Yeah, and I, I want to take, um, Kayla, your point um, up. And and to be honest, um, with the greatest of respect, I couldn't disagree more with, with your comment. I mean, um, so just just for clarification, so Kaylee says um, the numerical grade is necessary not to show how high a student's mark is, but rather to evidence that the student has or has not embraced the learning available from the classroom. For example, a mark of, of seven out of ten. Um, and, and then the feedback and continued learning will then offer the student the opportunity for that student to focus on what was not embraced initially, for example, the, the three out of 10. Um, as I said, with the greatest respect, I, I strongly disagree. The seven out of 10 for a task is not going to tell you whether a student has embraced the learning. You know, seven out of 10 is going to give you some indication of what a student can or can't do in the class. But what did that student start with? What if that student was actually a 10 out of 10 student and they only got a seven out of 10? Um, what if that student was a student who was only ever capable of getting a three out of 10 because that's the level? I mean, I look at my kids, um, you know, seven out of 10 would be, you know, easily achievable for my son. Um, he's probably more capable of a nine out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 in many of his subjects. Um, if he got a seven out of 10, in some respects, we'd be a little bit concerned. Emily, on the other hand, would be lucky to get maybe a three or four out of 10, particularly with maths. She would really struggle. She might work her absolute butt off be engaged, work really hard with her integration aid and with her teacher and, and, and do the best that she could she could absolutely do. And she might get a two out of 10, but the two out of 10 is not gonna be an indication of how much she's embraced the learning. It's just a, it's just gonna be an indication of a performance on a particular task. We, we can't then help Emily with her learning based on, on a number. What we can do though, through developmental rubrics is we can identify what Emily did well and and what we did, uh, what she didn't do well, and and we can identify those key key skills and, and knowledge in a developmental rubric, and I think that's the real um, power of it. So you know, and I, I guess that's hard if you haven't got a student in year seven at the moment. You, you're not getting exposed to the developmental rubrics, you're not seeing them in practice, and and I think you know once that happens, um, parents will have a better idea. Our plan at the moment, you know, where the year sevens are doing to a lesser extent, um, the year elevens are doing them. Um, next year, year sevens and eights uh, will be doing um, developmental assessment. Um, it'll be a heavy focus at 11 and 12. Um, and then from 2023, it, it'll pretty much cut across the whole school. This is not easy work and it's, it's really hard and time consuming for the teachers. And it really does make them have to, to, to reconsider their practices. And I tell you what, to come up with a developmental continuum for every skill and, and, and piece of knowledge in your subject, you have to absolutely be a curriculum expert and and teachers in teams in English teams, for example, if there's a skill, they have to talk in a team about, well, what does a skill at level six look like? What does a skill at level seven look like? What does a skill at level eight look like? And that's not something that the teachers in schools traditionally do, but our teachers are. Our teachers are probably as 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 uh, as across their their curriculum as as any teachers because 
they have to engage and interrogate it really deeply to be able to do a developmental rubric and a learning continuum. So, um, you know, I think there, there's a number of additional benefits that the teachers are getting, um, let alone what uh, what the parent uh, what the the students might be getting um, as value for their learning. So, as I said, this is a, a staged approach. It's a bit of a transition. Um, we're not rolling it out whole school. That would be, you know, almost impossible. Um, so it's 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 very much the staged approach. And you might not see some of this developmental assessment or as much um, of this work that we're talking about for another year or two. Um, and it won't necessarily replace Compass to answer an, uh, an early question. Um, you know, we'll still probably have have Compass, um, and and we'll you know it might be for example if there if there was a test. You know, we might report the mark or the assessment and report that to you, um, and and you can know that. But um, you know, be in no doubt that there'll be a whole bunch of other feedback um, that sits behind that, um, which is where the real power in in the learning is. Um, so just to clarify, Nicoletta says where they're being told they won't be getting a result score grade, those classes are using developmental rubrics and Maestro. Um, yes and no. Um, so though clearly, you know, we're talking about year sevens and year elevens, and we want our, our teachers teaching those year levels to focus on giving feedback through developmental rubrics. Um, but if we know that works, if we know that um, giving feedback uh, improves the learning a lot more than giving grades, we would be crazy to say to teachers in other subjects in other year levels that you should focus on um, just giving a grade. Um, and not giving feedback in some other meaningful form. So I think you'll start to see it in other year levels um, and in many subjects. Not something that we've mandated and had a, a had a big discussion with all of our teachers. We're very focused um, on the the particular teachers and year levels at the moment. But I think you'll start to see that transition transition more and more, Nicoletta. Um, you know, and I Sorry, guess I'm just going to unmute. Um, it's easier just to speak. I think I've mis um, explained that badly. What I meant was the other way around, which is that, so for example, in our reports, we're not getting a lot of uh, feedback or info. Yep. There's certainly no progression or developmental information. There's just those columns. Um, I'm feeling like it's happening from what I hear only, and he's not here now for me to check, um, in classes where he's being told in some classes he's in year 11, that um, he's not going to get a score. But then I don't feel like he's getting the amount of feedback that we're talking about tonight either. So I'd hate for there to be an absence of information or some sort of vacuum of information um, because he's still in his head um, is, uh, it's not, it's probably not just him, but um, he understands the new system, but he's still expecting a score, for example. So I don't think the message has really hit home yet. Um, and I, I just, all I'm asking is that if he's being told he's not getting a score, should he be expecting or should I be expecting that he's working with a developmental rubric in those classes? Um, Carrie's nodding. Yes. yes. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you should be, and they, they there will be the de those developmental rubrics. Again, we appreciate that um, that it's really difficult at the moment because our developmental rubrics are really difficult to attach to Compass, and that's why we started down this road with Maestro and and putting this this um this product together. And it, and it's going to you know once it's up and running and students are accessing it and parents. The, the wealth of knowledge that you'll get about where your students are at and, and what those next steps are, are going to, um, you know, tick all of those boxes in that regard. But it is messy at the moment and teachers are working really hard at being able to provide those developmental rubrics in, in a form to parents. And that that's the, that's the problem and that's where we're at. And as I said before, I'm meeting with learning area leaders next week to start to really try to streamline that process around how we provide that feedback to parents um, through Compass in the interim while we're, we're, we're um, transitioning. But absolutely, those year 11 um, students who are not getting those scores on their SAC because the SAC has a different purpose for that learning, will be having those developmental rubrics that will be communicating what the, where, where the student is at and what those next steps are. But that's not the only feedback too. And as Dylan Williams says, the quality feedback, the best quality feedback you can give students is immediate. And so we've got to really think about too that that feedback that's happening in the classrooms verbally, that's happening in the classrooms throughout the, the teaching and learning process is, is really critical and important. And, and we wanna make sure that our teachers are focusing their energies on giving that feedback 
to the students in those powerful ways rather than you know spending three weeks at the end of a semester typing up comments that pretty much just says you know great students having class you know sort of meaningless feedback in that way that's not going to actually help the learning process and I think getting that balance right is tricky and it's hard and it's even harder at the moment because we're in a pandemic as well and we've sort of embraced this this whole new sort of journey into developmental assessment so we know where we want to get to we've got those goalposts in sight and we're trying really hard to to get get that balance right as we're transitioning um, I am putting together a parent focus group because it's really important that we um, have that connection with our parents and we get that feedback. So I'm proposing to put a parent focus group together where we meet once a, once a term when we can meet online or if we ever get back to a normal sort of reality, we'll be able to meet face to face. But I'd love to have a parent focus group where I can be provided some feedback around the implementation of developmental assessment. Um, how we're transitioning, what some of the things are that are a bit messy that we can clean up along the way and, and just get that parent voice and that feedback as we go. Yeah, so I think um, I'd just to cover off a few things that, that we may have missed in, in terms of the, um, the chat. Um, you know, I think um, to answer your question, Tani, so is it every rubric per task or every topic? So you, there will be a developmental assess, uh, there'll be a developmental rubric for every unit. So for every unit in every subject, um, there will be a developmental rubric. And that could potentially mean that there's no specific, you know, test or assignment or, or learning task in a topic, but rather that the teacher is actually assessing as they go in class, you know, based on what students are doing in class without necessarily having to have something at the end to assess where students are. So um, at every de a developmental rubric will exist for every unit. So every unit, and they might go for, you know, um, somewhere around six weeks potentially, um, and, and you'll get um, a, an idea on, on how your student is progressing um, throughout that unit over those six weeks. And you should be able to see in real time every couple of days or every week, you know, um, some additions in the learning in, in, in that um, developmental rubric, being able to demonstrate it as, as the teacher marks that. Um, but what I would say, and I think a few have referenced that, you know, uh, clearly our, our teachers, <clears throat> some of our teachers aren't necessarily giving timely feedback in Compass. There's overdue learning tasks. You know that the, the quality of the feedback in those learning tasks might be limited um, and we will we, we'll acknowledge that we did that at the start and that's why we need a different uh, need to consider a different practice when compass was invented it was going to sort of be this game changer and we wouldn't have to worry about end of semester reports and that every parent would get feedback in real time as soon as a unit finished um, the feedback will, would be there well we know that that unfortunately hasn't been the reality uh, and there's sometimes there's a lot of learning tasks, too many learning tasks, and some parents give up. They don't know whether it's overdue or the teacher hasn't clicked the right box. Um, so the, the the feedback that you're getting through Compass is limited. We think the real powerful feedback that you will get is through Maestro. And Maestro is not necessarily going to be about um, assessing um, uh, SACs or necessarily assessing um, assignments or tests. Um, but it's going to be about assessing um, as the unit is progressing. Um, and that's, I think, something that uh, that, that really needs to be um, considered. So um, what we haven't talked about, which um, it's a shame that probably Ella's not in year eight or year nine, uh, Miss Wallace, we could have showed them an example of what a dashboard looks like, because I think um, the, the parents would, would really appreciate um, that we've developed a, a new dashboard. And that effectively means that um, there will be a program which will be part of Maestro that you'll be able to access, which gives you a summary on one page of uh, everything you need to know about your student. Um, it'll have their NAPLAN results. You'll be able to compare their NAPLAN results um, across, uh, compare their NAPLAN results to um, the rest of the state. It'll have their PAT results. So PATs are another form of testing we do once a year to sort of benchmark students and get an idea of where they're at. You'll get um, a, a snapshot and a summary of their attendance. You'll get a snapshot and summary of their learning tasks. Sorry, the um, information that students do put in, in into their reports and teachers put into reports 
twice a year, the progress um, reports, those bar charts that you see, um, and you'll get a snapshot of um, where your students are at in terms of their learning in each of the subjects. So when teachers mark Maestro, a, a developmental rubric in Maestro, um, that will indicate um, what level students that are at at English and in maths, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll be able to see that in the dashboard on one page. And I think, Carrie, you might be trying to get something up, maybe to demonstrate that. And, yeah, I and, am. And I, I think that's probably the missing link in, in, in something that will tie this together. To go to your point, Kaylee, I agree. You know, you, you're right. It is about rubrics. It's about feedback. And at times, it's about marks because we absolutely at times need to, to measure performance. At the end of the day, the year 12s, um, it's, it's not just about measuring their learning. It's also about measuring their performance. Can they actually um, achieve what they need to achieve on the day? Now, sometimes, um, unfortunately, the end of year exams in year 12s don't accurately measure learning because there's these other variables that get in the way of student performance, anxiety, you know, pr uh, pressure about, um, you know, whether they'll get into to their university course, whether they're sick. Um, so th their performance on their exam isn't always necessarily, you know, correlated to, to their assessment for learning. So th there is room for all of that. Um, absolutely, I agree. And when you tie all that together, we will give you more information as parents at Wong Turner College, I can guarantee you, than any other parents in Victoria. I guess, you know, that's a big promise. Um, Carrie has recorded this meeting, so it's there for prosperity. You will have more information, more data, and more knowledge about how your students are going at school. And I'm talking about specific information by subject than, than pretty much any parent will have access to in Victoria. You know, I'm, I'm really confident about that. And, and I think you'll start to see that when you start seeing Maestro and when you start getting exposed to the student dashboards that we will have available that we'll be able to share with you. Have you got one there, Carrie, just to give um, people a bit of a snapshot? Yeah, I just give me two secs. I'm just blanking out the name. Yeah, we could have used um, one of the Regano boys, but we won't do that. We'll, we'll, we'll blank out um, some of the names so you don't um, see, the, see their data. Um, but as I say, the the um, the missing link in this uh, are the um, dashboards that you will have access to as parents, and they will take the place of reports. Um, we know that our reports are limited, um, but here's an example of a dashboard. Can you just make that uh, slideshow make that nice and big for us, Carrie? Is that a bit better? Yeah. So here's a dashboard for a student on the left hand side, and you'll have access to this um, in real time every day. Um, so on the left hand side, you can see the NAPLAN results. Um, so you've got two different um, graphs there. Um, the colour is the student achievement. Tell me if I get this wrong, uh, Carrie. The colour is the student achievement. Uh, the grey sort of black uh, colour um, is the achievement for that whole cohort. So all of year seven across the state, I think. Yeah, the state uh, benchmark. The yeah. state. And then below that, you've got their growth. So you can see that this particular student um, actually had real positive growth um, in, in reading and spelling, well, well above the amount of growth um, compared to, to the cohort. So let me just take you back a, a, a little um, and let's have a look at the, the spelling. So look at, look at the spelling result in year seven and you can see the student is actually below the state average for spelling. But look at the growth, and this refers to what I was saying before. Just looking at that result, and you get those reports, and we got them yesterday, they'll be sent out shortly, the, the NAPLAN reports, if you're a parent of year seven or year nine, you'll just look at that graph on the, the chart, and it'll be down the lower end, and you'll go, oh, geez, you know, so-and-so is really struggling with their spelling. Um, but you're not getting the full picture because you're not looking at the growth. Look at what they've achieved in two years, um, that learning growth has been substantial, more than double the state average in growth for spelling. And, and that's not something that you get exposed to as a parent. And this is the stuff that Maestro will allow us to do that we haven't been able to focus on previously. Then you've got the PAT results. As I said, we do maths and reading testing, and we do that um, once every year at the start of the year. So we can compare performance um, from one test to another. And there you can see the learning growth based on PAT results as well. Then we go across and you can see attendance and the percentage of attendance 
Below that, you can look at the abs absences. Across on the right-hand side, there's those learning behaviours that I was talking about. You'll have that information. Um, there's some information about whether they got a, an award. Um, and there's some chronicle entry information in there as well. Now, we can't fit too much more on this page and we're gonna have to fit in the curriculum levels uh, for each of the subjects. So, you know, we'll have to work that around, um, but you'll have access to this information, which will be updated, you know, regularly every week, basically. Um, the NAPLAN results, the PAT results won't change much, but the absence data, um, the other information will change regularly. You'll have the maestro information, you'll still have access to, to Compass. So. Um, the information that you'll have access to a as a parent um, will be far in excess of, of as I said, of, of any other parent, I think, in Victoria, which is really exciting. And look, it's eight o'clock and probably um, well past our bedtimes. Um, but it, I mean, I think hopefully you can tell by the passion in our voice, in my voice, in Carrie's voice. I mean, this is something that we've spent a lot of time working on. And we're doing it because we know that it'll make it a positive. It'll, it'll make a positive difference. We know that it will improve the learning. We know that it will improve the achievement. And we know that this um, is going to be fundamental to making sure that our students can get the best outcomes. Um, we're not there yet. Our preferred reality is some way off. We're progressing to that, and that's why we're engaging in these sorts of conversations. And we're trying to get as much feedback as as we can off you. If you're not happy with the level of feedback that you're getting from the teachers of your kids, let us know. Um, you know, we, we really need to know that information. We need to, to follow up with those teachers. Part of having high expectations as a school is having high expectations that, you know, the teachers will be providing you with the information that will make a real difference in your kids learning. So if that's not the case, then you need to reach out. Um, anything else there for you, uh, Carrie, before we finish off? No, I've just put the link for um, if you would like to be part of the parent focus group, um, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, we, hopefully it wouldn't be really onerous in time. It's just an opportunity to touch base with a group of parents who are really interested and would really help us in the implementation because um, you know, for us to be able to keep adjusting and, and to get that balance right in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing, it's really important that we um, listen to, to everybody, so students, parents, teachers, um, et cetera, so that we can make it, make it happen and, and make it meaningful. So thanks, everyone. We really appreciate you giving up some time to, to get engaged with us uh, tonight around uh, conversation um, relating to assessment, lots of work for us to do. And I must say, our teachers have been um, just outstanding. You know, this work has been really done in the last 12 months, 12 to 15 months, when they've been, you know, largely at home looking after their own kids or, or, or trying to teach online. We've asked a lot of them um, and they've worked really, really hard. And it feels like we're in term seven of 2020, but they've been outstanding. You know, the, the success that we will have in the future is is because of the work that they've, they've been absolutely dedicated to. So uh, we're working towards that, um, achieving that goal. We're still a long way off, but your feedback um, is a really important part of that process. So thanks for being with us tonight. Um, and this doesn't end here. We will uh, we will certainly be having more and more of these conversations um, to engage with you. And hopefully, um, you know, we can, we can do that in person and, and not via WebEx. So uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you.